Testament Christians sometimes in their life will be involved in church buildings of a congregation. God intends for His people to build up rather than to tear down. Yet He has not legislated regarding the material blueprint for church buildings. But they have become an asset today in advancing His great cause. The spiritual New Testament church in any area is commanded to assemble. Therefore, the elders are to oversee that there is a physical meeting place to gather for Bible study, worship, and fellowship. Each congregation will face this challenge to either build in their location or to give aid somewhere else. So as we study this morning God's great building programs, let us learn some principles from the Bible that will help us. Beginning with our first one in point of time, we go to Genesis chapter 6, 7, 8, and 9 with the ark built by Noah. God identified the need and the material for the ark. As the opportunity was there, Noah would have been disobedient had he not been receptive to all the things that God said. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 7, By faith Noah, being warned by God about the things not yet seen, in reverence prepared an ark for the salvation of his household, by which he condemned the world and became an heir of righteousness, which is according to faith. The purpose for the building of the ark is simple as well as twofold. To deliver God's righteous ones from the sinfulness that surrounded them is the first purpose. In Genesis chapter 6, verse 5 says, The wickedness of man was great on the earth, and that every intent of his thoughts, of his heart, was evil continually. And then Peter, 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 5, and did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, a preacher of righteousness, with seven others, when he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly. The salvation of Noah's family depended on the ark. In Genesis chapter 6, verse 14 to 16, God gave strict orders about the constructing of the ark. The type of wood, the size, the floors, the door, and even the window. The second purpose is to assure the continuation of pure worship. In Genesis chapter 7, verse 1 to 3, we have seven, not just two of each clean animal was taken into the ark. Well, why was that? God was planning ahead because the animals were to be for worship later when this family left the ark in Genesis chapter 8 verse 20 then Noah built an altar to the Lord and took of every clean animal and of every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar now this is the very first time this word altar is found or mentioned in the Bible it is consistent with God's nature for us to plan ahead so that truth can be taught and worship can be pure for those who succeed us. The ark, perhaps the oldest, largest structure built by man, found its resting place on the mountains of Ararat. Now since then, having served its purpose, the timber would rot or decay and could be used for firewood. God's second great building program is the tabernacle. This word means tent, and this story is found in Exodus chapter 25 through 31, as well as chapter 35 and 36. Instruction for the building of a great boat on land was a piece of cake compared to the, the construction 
of the tabernacle being 45 feet long and 15 feet wide. And then you had a 150 foot long and 75 foot wide court around the sanctuary or sometimes referred to as the tent of meeting. It is a fact that the ark was larger in its dimensions. However, every item to the smallest detail on the tent and the court was given by God. Nothing was left for man to decide. Unlike a family of eight with the ark, who were these folks that had a part in the construction or the building of the tabernacle? They were the ones who came out of Egyptian bondage delivered by I am. Though formerly slaves, they were grateful for a new life to freely serve the God of Abraham, having a willing heart to give as they could. And in Exodus 35, they obeyed the voice of Moses and gave. They gave so much that they had to be held back from presenting their gifts of love to God. Can you imagine if it would be said of the church today, thus the people were restrained from bringing any more, Exodus 36, verse 6. They were also an unemployed people, no longer slave laborers, but they had skills and were willing to work. New Testament Christians who are willing to use their minds, their hands, their feet, and their skills are just as valuable as those of us who use our mouths to teach and to preach. The children of Israel were strangers and exiles on the earth, but they knew that they needed God to go with it. So are we. We are like them that desire a better country that is a heavenly one. Well, we're not completely sure as to what happened to the tabernacle. But having served its purpose in 2 Chronicles chapter 5, verse 1 and verse 5, states that the items of the tent of meeting was placed in the house of God. So the last time that it is mentioned by name as tabernacle is during the time of David in 1 Chronicles 16, verse 39. But the tent's fine linen and the metals would most likely be left to wear moth and rust destroy. Now having mentioned the items in the tabernacle being placed in the house of God, this brings us to the building of the temple in 1 Chronicles 28 as well as chapter 29. Now the tabernacle was great in what it had, but the temple even on a larger scale. David wanted a role in the construction. But being that he was a man of war, blood was on his hands. And the innocent blood of Uriah. You see, David, if you recall, had arranged to make sure that Uriah dies on a battlefield so as to cover up his adultery with Uriah's wife, Bathsheba. David intended to build a permanent home for the Ark of the Covenant and had begun the preparation in 1 Chronicles chapter 28. Yet God said, no, it will be your son Solomon that I have selected. So David gave to Solomon the plans that were pertaining to the temple and all that goes with it. In 1 Chronicles chapter 28, verse 19, all this, said David, the Lord made me understand in writing by his hand upon me all the details of this pattern. Though Solomon is given the privilege to build the temple, King David said to the entire assembly, my son Solomon, who alone God has chosen, is still young and inexperienced. And the work is great, for the temple is not for man, but for the Lord God, 1 Chronicles 29, verse 1. Then David goes on, still in 1 Chronicles 29, verse 3. And moreover, in my delight in the house of my God, 
The treasure I have of gold and silver I give to the house of my God over and above all that I already have provided for the holy temple. Though David is not in charge, he still jumps in with both feet to support the construction all that he could. Yet little people sometimes hinder rather than help unless the total project can be their very own. Brethren, remember, whatever we build is for those who will follow as well as those who are present. The people's role was that they followed the leadership who took the lead as pacemakers. This is uh, uh, established in 1 Chronicles chapter 29. They rejoiced, verse 9. They offered willingly, verse 9 through 15. They worshiped and praised God and recognized that they were only returning to God what he had first given to them, verse 16. As well as they gave all credit and glory to God and pledged future faithfulness to him in verse 18 through 20. King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon had spared Jerusalem and the temple twice before, but not this third time. In July 586 B.C., the city and the temple were put to flames. And the Jewish citizens that survived the onslaught went into Babylonian captivity for a period of 70 years. Then they were released by the Persians to return home. Now, rebuilding of the temple began under Zerubbabel. It was a modest structure, lacking all the elegant materials and the workmanship of Solomon's temple. Later, Nehemiah returns and he fortifies and rebuilds the walls of Jerusalem so that the city can now be a functioning community. Walls are important, though our current president does not seem to grasp that simple concept. But Nehemiah records in chapter 4, verse 6, so we built the wall, for the people had a mind to work. Now, King Herod began around 19 or 20 B.C. to remodel, to enlarge or re renovate the temple of Zerubbabel until it practically became a new structure more stylish by worldly standards than even Solomon's temple. Now in John chapter 2, Jesus cleanses the temple and the Jews confront him in verse 18. What sign do you show us seeing that you do these things? Well, Jesus gives them a sign. Destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. But thinking only physically, verse 20, the Jews therefore said, it took 46 years to build this temple, and you will raise it up in three days. This temple, taking nearly 50 years to construct, is Solomon's, I mean, is Herod's temple. And most assume that it was built on where Solomon's temple had been originally structured. Herod's is the one that Jesus and the apostles are examining in Matthew 24 when Jesus said, Not one stone here shall be left upon another which will not be torn down, which will be torn down in verse 2. Jesus predicts that the temple's future within that Jewish generation lifetime by the Roman army in 87, or 80, um, in AD, uh, the year of B70, He's describing the destruction there of that. This was God's righteous method in ending all about following the Old Testament law of Moses that began at Mount Sinai by removing their Jewish nation and knocking down the stones of the temple that had served its purpose. Well, God now builds his final great program on earth. It is an institution simply referred to as the church. 
Well, how did it come into being? What was it like? And what did Jesus have to do with it? Well, to answer these questions and others similar to this that are important, let's consider the passage that was read earlier in Matthew chapter 16. And we're going to look at verse 13 through verse 19. What can we learn from Matthew's passage about the church? The most important part of this wonderful statement in Matthew 16, verse 18, upon this rock I will build my church, is the I. Who was to build the church? Jesus. The church was established by Jesus. But who was this Jesus? Well, his disciples told him that the folks had said that he was John the Immerser, Jeremiah, Elijah, or one of the prophets. Now, these Old Testament figures were great and godly Jewish men sent by God. It also showed the people had recognized one truth about Jesus. He was a prophet. But Jesus was more than that. He asked his apostles, but who do you say that I am? In Matthew 16, verse 15. Now, Peter was quick to answer. You are the Christ. The son of the living God in verse 16. Peter affirmed two things in his statement. He said Jesus was the Christ. Jesus was the Messiah, the anointed one, for whom the Jews had been looking for hundreds of years since Moses declared, I will raise up a prophet among your countrymen like me. And I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command you. That's Deuteronomy 18, verse 18. Peter also said that Jesus was the son of the living God. He was the living God in that he was not dead, like the lifeless, cold idols of the Gentile heathens. Jesus was also God's son. Peter confirmed his belief in Jesus and Jesus' deity. Jesus was not just a man. He was God himself. He was God in the flesh. Now, Peter makes what we want to refer to as the good confession that all Christians make. Paul writes, take hold of the eternal life which you were called. And you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. 1 Timothy 6, verse 12. That means each of us having been water baptized to be saved, believe Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. This fact should impress upon us as we dwell on the church that Jesus built especially by one who was and is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Now, who in their right minds wants to be a member of a church not built by the Son of God? I know you don't, and neither do I. Also, the church was built upon a solid foundation. Jesus congratulated Simon Barjona due to his good confession about Jesus' divinity having been revealed by God. The source of divine truth about Jesus is God. He opened the truth to Peter through what Jesus was, what Jesus had said, and what Jesus did. God reveals it to us in the same way. We examine the evidence that is given in the Bible and then we reach our decision. Jesus next says, and I also say to you that you are Peter and upon this rock I will build my church. Well, what was the rock on which the church was built? Some mistakenly think that Jesus was talking about the church being built on Peter in verse 18. Yet several things are wrong in regard to this very twisted falsehood. One is that in the Greek language, this is what was originally written, the New Testament in Koine Greek, the word Peter and the word rock 
are different. They're not the same. They have different genders. Peter is masculine and what is feminine. They have different meanings. The Greek word for rock is Petra, and that means a ledge or a mass of rock. And the Greek word for Peter is Petros, and that means a detached stone or boulder. A stone that might be thrown or easily moved. That's found in Vine's Expository Dictionary of New Testament words. Peter himself was just a little pebble. And that well describes Peter. He was changeable, movable, indecisive. He would not have been a good foundation for the church. Also, the New Testament teaches that it was Jesus, not Peter, who is the foundation. For no man can lay a foundation other than the one which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 11. The church was built upon a solid foundation, Christ, and not a shaky, unstable Peter. Well, what then is the rock of which the church is built? Number one, the fact that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of the living God. Number two, faith in that fact. And number three, the good confession, a confession of that fact by Peter before others that were present. The rock hard foundation on which Jesus built his church was the rock of his own divinity. Any church built on Peter or another is not the New Testament church of Christ. And I do not want to be a member of any church that is not built by Christ. Do you? The church would also begin in the future. Again, back to Matthew 16, 18. I will build my church. Obviously, when Jesus was saying verse 18, he had not as of yet built his church. It was still going to be some time to come in a short time period in the future. The church had been planned from eternity, but the kingdom that Jesus proclaims is at hand or immediately coming. That's Mark, uh, Matthew chapter 4, verse 17. Well, when did it begin? Still predicted and not in existence in Acts chapter 1, verse 6. But it is recorded as having arrived in Acts chapter 5, verse 11. And great fear came upon the whole church and upon all who heard of these things. So somewhere between Acts chapter 1 and Acts chapter 5, the church began. In Acts chapter 11, Peter explains to the church in Jerusalem how the Gentiles had received the Holy Spirit. He says in verse 15, As I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them just as he did upon us at the beginning. The beginning of what? The beginning of the church. In Acts chapter 2, verse 1 to 4, the Holy Spirit came upon the apostles, then they started to preach for the very first time the New Testament gospel. And that was the start of the church in Acts chapter 2, verse 41, and following. The New Testament church began on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. I want to be a part of the church that started on that day. Not a member of some latter-day church that began hundreds or centuries later. Do you? Matthew 16, 18, I will build my church. My means the church belong to Christ. Not any pope, Martin Luther, John Calvin, John Wesley, Joseph Smith, or a hundred other founders of man-made churches. Of all the truth that we have studied and learned so far, I can add some more facts right now. <laughs> Jesus is the head of the church. 
He is the king of his kingdom. He has all authority. He is the savior of the church. And he purchased the church with his own blood. Here's your verses. Colossians 1 verse 18. Matthew chapter 28 verse 18 to 20. Ephesians 5 verse 23. And Acts 20 verse 28. All of this has practical meaning to us. If Jesus owns the church, should not the church be called by his name? If Jesus is the head of the church, should we not listen to and obey him rather than some human council or earthly pope? If Jesus is the savior of the church, should we not be part of it? I want to be of the church that Christ owns, that is his possession. Don't you? Back to Matthew 16, 18. I will build my church. Now notice church is singular. It is not plural. Jesus built only one church. Not a couple, a few, several, a dozen, or many. There is only one New Testament church. Just one church that Jesus established. There is one body, Ephesians 4, verse 4. And back in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 22 and 23, Paul explains that the one body is the one church that Jesus built. Now, of course, there are many congregations of this one universal body. But all these local congregations, they taught the very same thing. They worshiped in the same way. They had the same organization. And they proclaimed the same plan of salvation based upon God-given patterns. They were not different types of churches. They were the same church meeting in different places. In the first century, there was just one church that existed, and it was not a denomination. All these different denominations today did not come from God. In God's plan, there was but one church or one body. He cannot be pleased with all these hundreds of churches that claim to be following Jesus today. But God can be and is pleased with the one church that Jesus built, for that is his body. Now we can learn something about the nature of the church from Jesus' statement in Matthew 16, 18. The Greek word that Jesus used for church is ekklesia which comes from two words that mean out of and to call. So the word literally means called out. So we need to ask, but called out from what? The church is composed of those who are called out of darkness into Christ's marvelous light. That's found in 1 Peter 2 verse 9. Yet this word church can also mean assembly or congregation. So when we read in Romans 16 verse 16, the churches of Christ, that could be translated as the con or congregations or the assemblies of Christ. Now none of these ideas is a literal building of physical brick and mortar. The church existed for perhaps at least 200 years before it ever began to erect a material church building. They first met in their own houses. The church that Jesus built is never a physical place, but it is always a spiritual people. The church will be triumphant after Jesus said, I will build my church. He went on to say, and the gates of Hades shall not overpower it. Matthew 16, verse 18. What Jesus meant was, not even death can prevent my accomplishing this purpose. 
This is exactly what occurred. Jesus promised his church, but then he was crucified. So his disciples, they are confused and made sad. But Jesus arose from the dead. The power of death could not prevail over him. Then for 40 days, he spoke the things concerning the kingdom of God. Acts chapter 1, verse 3. Then he went on to establish the church in Acts chapter 2. And death could no more succeed in keeping those, us, in the kingdom from receiving our ultimate reward of eternal life. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 24. Despite all the opposition that Satan will hurl upon the New Testament church, in the end, the kingdom will be victorious. Now, Jesus also uses the words church and kingdom interchangeably. In Matthew 16, 18, I will build my church. Then in verse 19, I give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. So did Jesus change subjects? No. He was talking about the same institution in both verses. When he built his church, he set up his kingdom at the same time. The church and the kingdom are the one body of Ephesians 4, 4. In fact, in Colossians chapter 1, verse 13 and 14, the obedient believers of the first century had been transferred from the kingdom of darkness, which is Satan's, into the kingdom of Jesus, who was the Lord's son. Now, uh, the kingdom is presently here. It is the church which arrived in Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost. Those today who are waiting for the promised kingdom to be established on earth when Jesus arrives or comes, they wait in vain. Now, Peter was to announce the terms of the entrance into the church. Jesus said to Peter, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and that is in verse 19 of Matthew 16. Now the keys of the kingdom were the conditions which had to be met in order to enter the church or the kingdom. Peter was the first to use those keys in preaching the New Testament gospel to the Jews in Acts chapter 2. And he was the first to use the same keys to open the spiritual door of the church or the kingdom to the Gentiles in Acts chapter 10. Peter announced to those that believed to repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of their sins and that they would receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This is found in Acts 2, verse 36 to 38. Therefore, the terms of entrance in the kingdom for all accountable people were faith, repentance, and water immersion. When you do that, the Lord will add you to the New Testament church that Jesus built. Acts 2, verse 47. The words of Peter and the other apostles were to be authoritative in the New Testament church. Still in Matthew 16, verse 19, Jesus says, Wherever you, speaking to Peter, shall bind on earth, shall have been bound in heaven. And whatever you have loosed on earth, shall have been loosed in heaven. Jesus is saying to Peter, he's saying, when you teach something, what you bound is required. What you loose or is loud would be the official authority. His teaching here on earth would be recognized in heaven. However, this same problem, uh, promise was given a short time later to all the apostles by Jesus in Matthew chapter 18, just two chapters later, verse 18. Their teaching would be equally authoritative to that of Peter's. No less or no more. Now, does this mean 
that they could teach what they like or make up their own laws. No, because the phrase in verse 19 uses what's called a perfect participle in both cases, that what the apostles bind or loose had been confirmed already in heaven. The apostles were speaking the exact things that God in heaven had already decided are to be spoken to his human creation. For us, it means that what was said as commands 2,000 years ago have to still be obeyed in 2023. Let us remember that the ark the tabernacle and both temples have come and gone. They have served their purpose. Yet the New Testament church is for the entire population of mankind and it will continue to serve its divine purpose. Well, why? It was built by Jesus. It was built upon the Son of God. It began on Pentecost. It belongs to Christ, was and is the one body of Christ. It is the called out assembly of Christ, was and is the kingdom of God. It requires faith, repentance, and water baptism to enter. And finally, it was guided by the inspired apostles. When the church comes together, we can be strengthened by escaping the wicked world that's around us so that we can find aid as we are among ourselves to help us to remain faithful and to find help and aid to bring others to Christ. God gave precise dimensions of the Old Testament ark, the tabernacle, and the temple. And those positions for the temple were found in 1 Kings chapter 6, verse 1 to 6. Well, God has also designed the exact measurements of those who are in the New Testament church. And what those measurements are is that we must embrace the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 and 23. Those are our measurements. If you remain and die in a denomination, you will end up being lost as you are not connected to the New Testament church or to Christ. You are not covered in his precious blood through water immersion. And your denomination most likely is violating every pattern that God has established for his New Testament church. Listen up. Two more great building programs will come and be ushered in after the final judgment. They are heaven and hell. These two programs have yet to be seen. Meaning, the difference between the place of torment now and the hell to come is that hell is eternal. And it has Satan in it. The Hadean place of torment is temporal. And the devil has not taken up his permanent residence. But there will be a welcome mat, a welcome mat waiting for him when he enters hell. There is also a new Jerusalem coming down from the old heaven in Revelation chapter 21 verse 2. Now, if you recall, the present heaven was once corrupted by the devil and his rebellion. Therefore, disobedience or sin was committed within her pure gates. So God will create a brand new spotless heavenly abode that will be only for those obedient in the Old Testament and for all those who are in the one New Testament church faithfully living and dying in the Christian age will rest from their labors for all eternity. Now all others that make up mankind having sinned are hell bound forever. I cannot help anyone outside our physical building 
that refuses to listen to Bible truth. But as for you this morning, obey the New Testament pattern of salvation and allow God to add you to the church of Christ. Would you not come right now this morning, right now, as together we stand?